Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm excited about getting to preach today as I have been all through the book of Daniel. I appreciate you guys hanging with me. And if you're joining us online today, or if this is your first time in worship with us over the last few weeks, we had someone catch up with us on this very day. And we are in week seven of being surrounded by lions out of the book of Daniel. And they, as they left the first service this morning, they said, well, that was kind of a lot, Chris. And it is a lot. And we're in apocalyptic literature. But remember, we started this whole thing with Daniel 1 through 6. And I said, this is what it looks like to live faithfully for God in a godless culture. And Daniel's culture was godless. It was Babylonian. He was in exile. He was taken away from his homeland for his whole life. He never went back. And he knew, because he knew the prophecy in Jeremiah, that it would be 70 years. Now, here last week in Daniel chapter 7, and today in Daniel chapter 8, and next week, Daniel chapters 9 through 12, they're all apocalyptic literature. They are revelatory. They are like revelations. They are like, it is like, not revelations, but revelation. And like Ezekiel, in that we're talking about the end of all time. And And there's our sound effect. Did that scare you? No. Now, if you heard the trumpet of the Lord, would that scare you? How would you react? And that's what we're going to be talking about. Future is our future uncertain. That's how I titled this message. And we're really going to talk about the end of all days and the end times. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you believe the Bible, and that's what our church values and that's what we say, then you realize there's an end of all things. Now, we may die before the Lord's return, or we may not. And I'm not trying to create anxiety or create fear. Because faith overcomes fear. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ and have received his grace, and his grace reaches to anyone and everyone, no matter where you've been, what you've done, and who you are. Because God, like Dan, led a great worship set this morning. I appreciate the worship team. I appreciate all of our staff. But I am ready to preach now because of what you did this morning. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Very powerful. So if you will join me in Daniel chapter 8, we're going to look through the first five verses in all of Daniel chapter 8 and see what God has in store for us. So in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first, and I saw in the vision and When I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision, and I was at the Uli Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high. Remember that. But one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last, and I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue me from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. And as I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. Remember that. Can you imagine A goat crossing over the whole earth, not touching ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. Now, I hope you, as you read this, you're asking the question, who's the goat? And my first thought is Michael Jordan. (laughs) Because obviously he floats across, right? Then I thought of the anticlimactic hero Tom Brady. Don't cheer for him. I, we, we don't like him in Indiana. <laughs> but who's the goat? Just think about it. And then look at verses 6 and 7. And, and he came to the ram with the two horns which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal. And he ran at him 
in his powerful wrath, and I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Poor ram, right? And then the goat became exceedingly great, But when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Now, let's just step back. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2 interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, actually told Nebuchadnezzar what he dreamed. And remember, it was the statue, the golden statue, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and toes of iron and clay. And remember, it was Babylon, and it was Persian or Median, Median and Persian culture. It was uh, Greek, and then Roman, and then the Roman Empire, mixture of... of uh, clay and iron. And then in Daniel 7 last week, remember the beast, you know, the lion and the the bear and the leopard. Is that right? Yeah. Bear and the leopard and then the beast that was beyond comprehension, beyond words that Daniel talked about, which was Rome. Talking about that. Now, the first, the statue dream that he interpreted from Nebuchadnezzar was early on in his teen years. Last week's message out of Daniel chapter 7 had been three years prior to this. He probably was in his, and it was 14 years prior to him being thrown in the lion's den, which would mean he would have been about 50 or 60 years old. Now, this week in Daniel chapter 8, he is going back to Belshazzar three years after the previous dream in Daniel chapter 7. And I know that's a lot to contain, but... But what I'm trying to convey to you, it is very, very important that we understand the time that Daniel lived in when he prophesied and when he wrote this book. Because if you Google Daniel, the book of Daniel, and these chapters, and when it was written, it will say that he wrote this maybe a hundred years before Christ. And most of these things had already transpired, according to Google. Now, I like Google, I like Wikipedia, but sometimes they are completely wrong. And on this occasion, the authorship and the timeline that they give is completely wrong. Conservative scholars, and it's backed up by Jesus, which anytime Jesus says anything and quotes Daniel, obviously, I mean, he's, he knows because he's always been, always will be, and he wrote the book, basically inspired men to write the book. So he's the author. He knows that Daniel was a solid book. And it was written 400 to 500 years B.C., by Daniel. And that's why it is in the canon of the Bible. Why is that so significant? Is because, you know, the whole first six chapters of Daniel have to do with Daniel's character and integrity. And if this is false, then all six chapters are false and all, everything else in the book is false. It all teeters on when it was written. Saying all this, Again, we're seeing the same pattern that we saw in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. Although it skips Babylon and it goes directly to the ram, which was the king of Persia. Actually, it was the king of Media, or Media Mesopotamia and Persia, the Medo-Persia Empire. But remember, the one horn was longer, which was Persia. Well, why would you say all this? Well, because if you remember, if you watched the movie 300... Those were the Persians. If you read the book of Esther, those were, I was fine. those were the Persians. And they were a ruthless culture that introduced crucifixion and killing people on a tree. Super important. But then the goat was the king of Greece. Now, if you see Mitch and Kim, they just got back from Greece and had a great time. Chalos, that is. And and they'll tell you all about Greece. But that large horn was the first king of Greece in the Grecian kingdom. And that was Alexander the Great. And the reason why we've got this all up up here is because if you're writing this down, 
We're trying to take some time so that you can write this all down. But then Alexander the Great had a small and a quick army and he conquered the known world and killed all, you know, the Persians and, and took over that kingdom. But he had an untimely death. He did all that in his 20s and his early 30s and then he died suddenly. He was an alcoholic and probably, they guess, had, had some other diseases as well as a heart attack. Probably is how he died. Now, since he did not have any dependents, he had no children, then his kingdom was divided up into the four horns, which were the four Greek generals, north, south, east, west, in, in the whole Greek empire. And then there's this small horn that rises up through the Seleucian general, and his name was Antiochus Epiphanes, and you can say this two ways, Antiochus Epiphanes or Antiochus Epiphanes, which is hard for me to say. And, and Epiphanes means the illustrious one. And, and Antiochus Epiphanes was so, so narcissistic, so self-centered, that he entitled and called himself the illustrious one. Now, that, that's, pretty, that, that's a pretty big ego. That's a megalomaniac. And in fact, he printed up his own money. That's kind of crazy. But here's a picture of Antiochus or Antiochus Epiphanes on a coin from that time period. Now, I don't know if you ever imagined having money with your picture on it or not. Probably not, but maybe, maybe. But Antiochus Epiphanes was a type of Antichrist. We're going to talk about this a little bit more. Let's look at verses 10 through 12 of this passage. And it grew great, talking about Antiochus, the little horn, even to the host of heaven. And some of the hosts and some of the stars, it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. Notice that capitalization. Who is the prince of the host? Could be referring to Michael the archangel or Jesus Christ himself. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And the host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offerings because of the transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. Now this is kind of crazy. What Daniel, through this vision, is seeing is the desecration of the temple which occurred about 175 B.C. And Antiochus actually took the altar, put the image of Zeus, and on the 25th day of every month, they would offer a pig in sacrifice to the god Zeus. And Antiochus' goal was to remove Judaism and anything Jewish and anything that was opposed, and the only religion was the god of Zeus and the Greek gods. Now look in verses 23 through 25, and this gets even more interesting. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. So what would that mean? Not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. And then he goes on and says, And by his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great, and without warning he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. He became strong, but not by his own power. We're talking about a supernatural power, an evil power, 
the prince of this world versus the prince of righteousness, the king of kings and the lord of lords. And what's interesting that Antiochus Epiphanes is a type of antichrist. And there have been antichrists throughout all the ages. And, and the prophecies about the antichrist are already and not yet. If you have your Bibles, look at verse 25. That is not talking only about Antiochus Epiphanes. It's talking about the antichrist that will come at the end of all days. There will be the antichrist. Now I showed you the head of the coin with Antiochus's Epiphanes picture, but I want to show you the other side of this, which is just fascinating to me. This is the, the, the tail side of, of the coin. And what it says in, in the Greek is Antiochus Epiphanes, God manifest. What he's saying is that I am God in the flesh. This is blasphemy of all blasphemies. This is how narcissistic, narcissistic, this is how anti-Christ is. And, and he killed, had 40,000 Jews killed in Jerusalem about 169, 170 B.C. And, and, and uh, maimed and or destroyed about another 40,000, 80,000 at that time. He wanted to blot them out, completely destroy them. Now, this is fascinating because throughout the ages, this little people, the, the, today the Jews only number about 20 million in the whole wide world, like I've preached before, and people hate them with a supernatural hate. And I believe that is in evil-inspired, satanic hate for the Jewish people. My Muslim friends, and yes, I do have Muslim friends, just hate the Jews and hate Israel. Just unbelievable. I said, why do you hate them so much? And they go, rah, 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 rah. I said, they're just a little people. Why don't you just give them a little space? Well, that's our land. It's crazy how much they hate the Jews. And throughout history, their antichrists have risen up. In 70 AD, the Jews were nearly destroyed. The temple worship, the temple was completely wiped out. There is no temple in Jerusalem today on the Temple Mount. It's never been rebuilt. When we see it happen, we will know that we are in the final days. It will happen. Maybe in our lifetime, maybe not. But everything, the, the stage of history is set. It's coming. It's so fascinating, the spiritual warfare that's going on. John the Apostle writes it this way in 1 John 2, 18. He says, children, it is the last hour. And I would say, folks, we are in the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Now, if you wrote that 2,000 years ago, you know that we're even closer now. And it's interesting that we're almost, in the next 10 years, we will be 2,000 years exactly from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. How much closer are we going to be? But you might say, well, Chris, why does evil rule and why is there antichrist? Couldn't God just wipe them out just like that? And I say, absolutely. As we sang this morning about God's sovereignty and his power, it, it, there's no contest. It will be over in a flash. God does not remove evil from the world, but he comes through Jesus Christ to redeem the world. Not only to redeem you, but every one of us. Here's how uh, Peter writes this in his second letter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-7, through seven, he says this. He says, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of a reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing, first, this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, have you heard this before? 
Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the worlds that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Talking about Noah and the flood. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire. We know how it's going to end. Being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now I want you to notice in this passage, first of all, that Peter is trying to stimulate them to a sincere faith and a sincere understanding of the word of God and a sincere lifestyle. And what we miss is that sincerity, we think about genuineness, we think about authenticity, we think about earnest desire. But in this passage, what that means is wholesome thinking. And, and Peter is saying to them, in this godless culture where we're being bombarded by everything around us, how do you stimulate wholesome thinking in your lives? And how do we share that together? Well, in this worship service, we should have been stimulated to worship God with wholesome words as we sing together. It's what we put into our hearts and minds. What, what comes in through the streaming services that belong to and through our iPads or our, our tablets and our phones and everything around us. There's a war going on for our minds. This sincerity is talking about a pure mind, a wholesome mindset. And Peter is also say, asking this question. What are you doing to refresh your memory of who God is? We, we sang about it this morning. Who this God that sent his son to save us, to redeem us. It's like Dan read my sermon already this morning, which he did. And who he says you are. Do you know you are the beloved? You are loved by God. Whether you're in the kingdom of God or whether you're outside of the kingdom of God. God's love and grace is reaching out to you and drawing you near to him through his Holy Spirit. It is whether or not you hear his voice and know that he is knocking at the door of your heart. And that he has a plan and he has a purpose. You aren't here by accident. It's not random. It is by God's purpose that he called you into existence to be who you are. To, to fulfill his purpose in your life. He loves you. And then Peter goes on to say this. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. There will be an end. And since all things are thus to be dissolved, since all this is going to pass away, this is all going to be burned up, there's nothing that's going to exist after this, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Wow. Have you ever thought that your job was to hurry up the kingdom of God? I've got to confess to you, in my, my younger days, I wasn't so much about that. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have a wife. I wanted to have a family. I wanted to serve God. I didn't want Jesus to come. The only time that I ever wanted Jesus to come again was right before my Greek final. And I almost had an ulcer at that point. I said, Lord Jesus, come. I don't want to take this final. A little selfish, aren't I? But you know, there's nothing that's going to be more glorious or more fulfilling than that day of the Lord for those that follow Jesus. And Peter says this, he says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Folks, if we get so focused on the world and we're fighting the world all the time, the culture all the time, and we don't realize who sovereign is and who is in control, 
we will lose our stability. That's what Peter said then and it is true now. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. See, our lives become what we focus on. Let me say that again. Our lives become what we focus on. So the necessary question is, what are we focusing on? Are we getting better? Are we growing in the grace of God? Because of what we see and hear and listen to and who we surround ourselves with. That's why I think if you're online, I'm glad you're here. But if you're in this room, I'm, I'm even gladder, if that's a word. Because we are here to encourage and love each other. To, to support each other. And, and being involved in an adult Bible fellowship, or if you call it Sunday school, or children's church, or student ministry, that's just another way to grow, grow in God's grace and be surrounded to stimulate wholesome, sincere thinking. To be in the Word of God daily, to pray, to, to memorize His Word, to love God, to focus on what is good for us, what God designed us for. Brings me to another question. How dependent are you on the grace of God? You know, as, as your pastor and one of your pastors, sometimes I get a little frustrated. I get a little, like, <clears throat> just tired. I really do. And then I have to stop and think, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this in my own strength and power. And, and guess what? That's not on me. It's by God's grace. It is by God's work. I just can do what I can do and only that. And sometimes I get stressed out and I think uh, we're not doing what we need to do. We're not doing enough. I'm not doing, you know, blah, you know, all of those type things. All those frustrations. And then I got to stop and say, hey, Chris, you know, you can only do so much. But what you can do, you do. But you rely on God to do what he can do. And you need to have more faith in what God can do. It's beyond me. And it's beyond you. We just do what God calls you to do in this moment, at this time, where you are, wherever you are. And that is enough. God will do the rest by his grace for his glory. We just get reminded how human we are, don't we? And then Daniel wraps it up in verse 27 of this passage. And I just think this is so powerful. He says, And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Daniel was overwhelmed. Now, it doesn't say in in, in Scripture, but this vision and and what what occurs gloriously, and and next week, you know, I'm going to encapsulate the next three chapters, but he has angelic interactions like he does in this passage. And, and, And we think, well, you know, we see angels on TV and things like that, but this is like... A sensory overload experience to the max. Daniel saw all this and he didn't even understand it. Then I rose. This is what's so powerful to me. He was overcome, lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business. Daniel in faith, by grace of God, he went about the king's business. He didn't throw in the towel. But he went about the king's business. But I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Isn't that crazy? That he could interpret all those visions and dreams that Nebuchadnezzar had and, 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 and Belshazzar, Belshazzar had. But he couldn't even tr- understand his own vision. But he was about the king's business. And, and really... Isn't that what we're to be about? Is the king's business? I want to wrap up with three questions of reflection this morning. And the first one is this. Am I hastening God's kingdom? Am I focused on the kingdom of God? Folks, worshiping God and following Jesus isn't an add-on to your life and career and your family. It's the center. It is Our number one focus is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else pales 
pales in comparison. Second question to reflect on is this. Am I only about sin management or am I a part of God's redemptive story? Now, a lot of times we get into, yeah, I'm tempted to do this, I'm tempted to do this, and this is the temptation, and I sin this way and I sin that way, and, and communion is a time to kind of reflect and we call ourselves into account. But there's something beyond sin management, and that is about the, the, the kingdom of God and the grace of God and the redemptive work that he is doing around us. That God's grace and God's redemption. Some of you are here. Some of you walk through the door today for the very first time. And you're hearing something that is totally foreign to you. But it's because of God's calling and direction in your life. That's the grace of God. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. I don't even, I don't understand it. We will never understand it. But God is calling and doing a work. And all we can do is go along with God and recognize that we are a part of that redemption story. Somebody said it like this, and I think it's so fascinating. Old preacher said it this way. He said, I want to be so part of God's redemption story that all around me is so much like the kingdom of God that the will of God is being done on earth as it is in heaven, just like Jesus prayed. And so when I die and I go to heaven, I won't even realize I'm in heaven because the, the redemption that occurred on earth is so much like heaven. And it's because God has created that culture of the kingdom, a kingdom culture here on earth. Because we are doing his will and part of his redemption story. Isn't that crazy wild? Only God could do that. And finally, third is, am I dependent and cognizant of the grace of God? Now, if you grew up in a Christian church like me, you probably didn't get a lot of grace when you were growing up. You got a, probably a lot of legalism and a lot of, a lot of you do this, you don't do this, you, you do that, you don't do that. You, if you do this, you're going to hell. And I told you last week, there's a lot of times when I thought I was all by myself and I thought Jesus had come and I got left behind because that's how guilty I was and that's how guilty I felt. Because I didn't understand God's grace. God's grace is that he loves you with a crazy, radical, reckless love that's beyond our comprehension. You are his child, and he wants you to know him. And he will do anything and everything and knock down every wall and every barrier to get to you. You are hounded by the hound dog of heaven who is knocking at the door of your heart, and he wants you to have a relationship with him. Not that he needs you, but we need him so desperately. That grace is unfathomable. And that's why we sing about it so much. Because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. is so amazing. His blood was shed in our place. That is the grace of God. God will never love you any more than he loves you right now. And he will lo never love you any less than he does right now. And it's not about your behavior. It's about who he is and what he has done. Let me tell you about the grace of God. And it tears me up because his reach is so long. That it's not beyond, you are never beyond his grasp. He is reaching out to you. And he loves you in an incredible way. I just pray that you understand the grace of God. It is unbelievable, it's unfathomable. As, John, I mean, as Daniel had the apocalyptic vision that he had no words for, that John had the apocalyptic vision in Revelation, that he ran out of words to describe it, that, that is the grace of God and that is the love of God. I can't describe it. It's beyond my words. But you need to experience it because there's nothing else like it. He loves you. 
And so, folks, if you don't know the grace of God, you don't know the love of God, you don't know what, understand what Jesus did for you, I just pray that the Holy Spirit will quicken you in your spirit, in your soul, down to the, the depths that you can feel and experience that grace. Will you please stand with me as I close in prayer? Eternal God and Father, we are, again, grateful. Father, you blow our minds. In, 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 in your grace, in your spirit, in doing your will, Father, you are awesome and you are sovereign. There is no other like you on heaven and on earth, nor will there ever be. You are from the beginning until the very end and beyond that. You are infinite and amazing. And Father, we are... We just thank you for Jesus who, who places us in your presence, who allows us to be in relationship with you through him. By his, his blood, we are covered and we are saved and, and we get to call you Father and to know your grace and your love and your spirit that transforms, that delivers, that saves, that heals, that redeems. Father, we just want to be a part of your restoring kingdom work here on earth that, that when we go to heaven we won't even realize it because our experience on earth will be so like the kingdom of God because your will has been done and father we understand that's ideal that we're in a war and there's a spiritual battle and father it's going on right now in the hearts and minds of the people that are hearing this message I just pray that you would do your work that only you can do. And we just give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you come this morning?